everyone and welcome to the social contract a commander podcast i'm mike almond and joining me is my co-host alex lap alex Oh, dear lord don't do that there's do there's what? no need for any of that uh, i'm sorry it's it's turned into it's turned into night though yeah you should have cast what a terrible night to have a curse mike <laughs> alex let's go to innistrad yeah let's let's return to innistrad and let's talk about um, a lot of cards in this uh, Innistrad Midnight Hunts and Midnight yeah. Hunt Commander set that really uh, tickle our fancy as political and social cards, maybe even some group hug cards and removal stacks, symmetric effects. Mm-hmm. Everything that's within our purview, we're going to be talking about not just all of the new Commander cards and all the new Commanders. So if that sounds interesting to you... I think we're going to have a really fun time this episode, Mike. And as a reference, let's talk about the last couple of sets here. Yeah. So I love Dungeons and Dragons. We didn't have a ton to it play with as far as our stuff. podcast. Yeah. Right, no, exactly. No politics, nothing new and interesting for our podcast specifically. Right. Which now seems a little bit weird to me to say out loud. The game about sitting together and right. like playing a game with your friends and making things up as you go along and improv... Had the had a very small amount of cards that were yeah, all about. We've definitely been getting yeah. more social effects. Yes. in recent years than we have in past years. Right. Well, I was going to say in the in the set before that, you know, or well, I don't know if it was before because there's so many things that there's come out so now. many sets. But but Strixhaven that had a good amount of stuff. It but that's did. also because one of the commander decks right. was very specifically. Yeah. About politics. The Silver so, Quill deck was a political deck, so absolutely. kind of tip but, the scales. But here's the crazy thing. Uh, we've got a ton of cards to talk about for this set. We do. We do have a lot of cards. All right, so before we get into all of this, we have a new mechanic. I mean, we have a new mechanic because now it's an actual keyword as opposed to just being a thing that happened. Um, and there's some triggers on some cards that care about. I don't, Alex. Uh, we're gonna go into our uh, 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 judge judge's corner here. Uh, explain the daybound nightbound thing to me. Yeah, Mike. Um, on first glance, daybound and nightbound just looks like a fun implementation or twist on transforming double face cards, which are cards that have a uh, effect on both the front and the back face. But this is a little bit different than we've seen before, and part of the reason why cards like Moon Mist, which is a uh, transform all uh, humans, werewolves, I don't have that card in front of me, but very Mm -hmm. popular werewolf card. That doesn't work with uh, with these cards because these cards have the new mechanic of Daybound and Nightbound and Day and Night as two different states of the game. Um. If a creature is daybound, then it's going to enter the battlefield uh, on its day side, and it's going to be constantly looking, uh, just as the game state is constantly looking, to see if a player casts no spells. And if it becomes daytime and a player casts no spells, then it becomes nighttime. And when it becomes nighttime, um, all uh, daybound and nightbound permanents that are on their day side will flip to their night side but this isn't transforming technically so you can't just transform these and and just get to do whatever you want they are subject to this constant ebb and flow of okay if it's daytime and player casts no spells it becomes nighttime and if it's nighttime and a player casts uh two spells during their turn then it becomes daytime on the next turn and this just goes back and forth and back and forth And we're going to see that right away in our first card. Mike, why don't you talk to us about this one? I like this one, and I need to figure out if I actually love it. Uh, Rural Cathar, uh, two generic and a white for a 2-2 human soldier werewolf. That is a lot of 
creature types when this creature enters the battlefield or transforms into Brutal Cathar. Exile target creature and opponent controls until this creature leaves the battlefield with Daybound. Then on the opposite side, we have Moon Rage Brute. 3-3 three, three, Werewolf with First Strike, Ward, Pay 3 Life, and Nightbound. So, Alex, when this creature enters the battlefield as Brutal Cathar, you exile a creature until it leaves the battlefield. Yeah, like a Feed Hunter. And then when it flips into Moon Rage, is, is this creature still on the battlefield? This so creature, creature is still on the battlefield. Out? When a permanent transforms, it has not entered nor left the battlefield. It remains on the battlefield and it has changed its state. Right. So but it's the day bound, night bound. Right. It it isn't technically transforming, but it is at the same time. It is transforming, but I, it's we can weird. make we can make a yeah. whole episode about day bound and night bound. But right now, we just want to get through these fun cards. That's fair. Um, when is, Brutal Cather transforms into Moonrage Brute, when day becomes mm-hmm. night, the cards that have been exiled under Brutal Cathar remain exiled. Okay. And the important thing is that when night then again becomes day, and Moonrage Brute transforms back into Brutal Cathar, its ability is going to trigger again, and you're going to exile another creature in opponent controls. This is ridiculous. So, in a game of Commander, this can be triggering... Any number of times per round of the game, depending on how many spells players are casting. If a player casts no spells, next turn it becomes night. We have a transform. Then let's say a player casts two spells. The following turn it comes back in a day. You get another exile trigger. And like that can just keep happening. This thing can just exile things again and again and again. And I mean, I know that like in Commander, life is a resource even more than, you know, just standard magic. But Ward, pay three life, is still a thing. It, like, there's still a tax if you're going to try and remove this. It is a thing, Mike. Uh, let's remind our listeners what Ward is. Ward is kind of like Hexproof, a little bit. Ward says that opponents can't target this permanent unless they pay the additional cost of whatever the Ward is, in this case, three life. So that's not really much of an obstacle to a commander player. Um, oh, however, no. it... It seems interesting to me to want to play spot removal on a three mana creature, um, but it almost kind of seems inevitable at the same time, right? It's going to keep yeah. building up value. Just you don't even have to do anything. Just as the natural uh, state of the game progresses, people sometimes cast two or more spells. Sometimes they cast no spells, and this will just keep transforming and keep exiling things as long as people haven't spot removed it and eventually somebody will feel the need to and then they burn a spot removal on a 2-2 creature which is really funny to think about right well even even at the same time like it, this it doesn't say when this creature goes to the graveyard it says until this creature leaves the battlefield so if you wanted to exile your own stuff flip it over a couple of times well you can only exile creatures in opponent controls mike oh well yeah. never mind then this, see they're new cards Speaking of new cards, let's move on to the next one. Absolutely. Now, it, before we do that, let's okay. keep this in mind. Uh, Brutal Cathar is a Boros color identity card. Yes. Even though we're talking about it in white, just because that's how our script is sorted here, because the back face has the red color indicator and the red border, we know that this is actually a Boros ID card. It can only go in red, white, plus decks. There you go. Okay. Yeah, let's go on. So next card that we want to talk about here, Celestial Judgment. Four generic white, white for sorcery. For each different power among creatures on the battlefield, choose a creature with that power. Destroy each creature not chosen this way. So this is there are a couple of effects that say everybody chooses a creature mm-hmm. or everybody gets to save a certain amount of power on a creature for a board wipe. This one is pretty interesting because you basically get to say zero through infinity. Um for each creature that has a power, you get to pick one of that specific power, and then everything else is destroyed. That's a really powerful board wipe. That's really selective. It is. You get to make some very interesting choices here because, yes, you can save a good chunk of your board depending on how diverse your power distribution is. But more likely than not, since you do have to pick one of each power if there is one, Uh, You can make some very political decisions and say, okay, well, only my opponents have creatures of, let's say, five power, but there's two of them. 
So which one am I going to save? Let's talk about this. Mm-hmm. This is the kind of conversation that can happen with a board wipe like this. So it is going to be, it, there are going to be times where. Where you're forced to. You're forced yeah. to. Yeah. You, oh man, there's a four power creature that I really need. I to get really wish I could remove it. Yeah. But I can't because it's the only one. Right. But you know what? If that's the worst case scenario that every once in a while, you're not going to be able to hit one of the more problematic things because this has the ability to be selective on destroying everything else. Mm-hmm. That's great. I, I like this board wipe a lot. Yeah, I think the one place this doesn't fit is if you're running a token deck with whites. Yeah. Because in that case, most of your creatures are probably going to have the same power and you're yeah. really going to hurt yourself. But there are a lot of other board wipes in white that support a token strategy, so we don't have to worry about that. Exactly. But, Mike, I would like to actually move to the other board wipe that's in okay. this set that I think sure. is – it's less political – but the power level is much higher. And that's Blasphemous White. <laughs> yeah, Blasphemous White. Vanquish the Horde for six white white. That's eight mana. It's a sorcery. This spell costs one less to cast. For each creature on the battlefield, destroy all creatures. Um, yeah, obviously, this is a very clear analog to Blasphemous Act, which is an eight and a red for a similar effect that it costs uh, one less to cast for each creature on the battlefield. And it deals 13 damage to each creature. That's in red. Mm -hmm. It always bothered me, really, that other colors in Magic have these excellently costed board wipes that just do things that white could never do. Now we have a very similar effect. Now, granted, it's one mana extra, but at the same time, it's also a destroy effect, which won't always be relevant above and beyond uh dealing 13 damage to everything but dealing 13 damage to everything means that creatures with protection from red or protection from all colors or anything that blasphemous act protection right. from sorceries uh that they can avoid that but they can't avoid this only indestructible a, creatures can there's a lot more evasion on that right and frankly if you're doing 13 damage to an indestructible creature it doesn't really care as much as right as well. so the you can cast this for two as long as there are six yeah. creatures on the battlefield which in commander is quite a common board state right it, it it's it seems unlikely that you're going to cast this for more than you know two three mana more times right. than not uh because otherwise what are you trying to sweep the board from but it's a it's it's efficient you know i i white I, I, I'm not saying it's catching up, but it is it is getting consistently more stuff that I'm happy about. Right. As opposed to going the same direction or backwards from where it was. And Although, I, I to be fair, design. this kind of effect, powerful board wipes, has always been in White's wheelhouse. This is just another excellently costed board wipe, which is good. Sure. And I'm really glad we have this board wipe, but this isn't exactly a new direction for White. Well, then how about we talk about a different new direction? For sure, let's, let's hear about it. I love curses. Let's get into some curses. All how right. about the Curse of Conformity? Four generic and a white for an enchantment or a curse. Enchant player. Non-legendary creatures enchanted player controls have base power, toughness, 3-3, three, three, and lose all creature types. I think that this is an interesting one. First of all, because the card art is creepy. It's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, they don't these? have faces. No, yeah. and, and and you know whether you'll fit in isn't up to you at all. That's that's yeah. that's. Um, this is a I, curious one. Yeah, um, I I think it's kind of weird because I wish this cost less. Yeah, you know it's a five yeah. it's a five mana cost spell, but if they had made it all creatures, it would have been overpowered to me Mm -hmm. so it's kind of it 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 could have gone in either direction and become like an a card i think now it's probably like a b minus c plus but it still does some interesting things it's important to look at this through the lens of a silver bullet which is how i look at curses and in that case a strategy becomes immediately obvious this effect is going to shut down all tribal decks mm-hmm. because tribal decks depend on tribal synergy, creatures on the battlefield having the creature type of choice. And this removes all creature types from all non-legendary creatures. So that tribal synergy is just gone. 
But in addition to that, it's also hosing these big power decks that are uh, not relying on counters or plus X plus X effects. We're talking about like big, beefy, big creature decks like big Stompy Green decks, Eldrazi mm-hmm. decks, decks that rely on creatures with a very high base power and toughness. And this really just kind of is a very humility style effect, but it's only for one player. Right. And the other part of that, they're not losing any of their abilities. So you're not turning right. anything off as far as creatures. You're just right. re- potentially reducing their base power and toughness if, if it's a big stompy deck. And like you said, on tribal themes, it's the other parts of the tribal theme. It's not necessarily uh, like I was sitting here going, oh, well, you can turn off elves and you can turn off goblins. Well, kind of, but... Well, yeah, when they're if low goblins, power tribes, yeah. you're kind of buffing them a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, little you're bit. not getting as much synergy for, hey, for as many goblins as you have, make that many goblins kind of things. Right. But, that is an interesting angle, though, when you think about it. You could cut some sort of deal where you yeah. play this on a on a player, maybe a token player or an elves player, that doesn't any longer need the tribal synergy because their board state is complete but what they do need is a nice pump for their little guys this could in theory i know that's a magical christmas style thing but you could foresee something like that happening i mean it's a curse like at a certain point yeah curses are all playing in they're they're all playing in some kind of magical christmas land because it is ah i'm going to play this thing that's going to take one person and either propel them or put them back in the stone age exactly Uh, speaking of putting somebody back in the Stone Age. Um, I, this is my least favorite card because it's it, it just makes me sad, but it's very efficient. Uh, curse of Silence. White. It is a one mana or a curse. Enchant player. A Curse of Silence. As Curse of Silence enters the battlefield, choose a card name. Spells with the chosen name. Enchanted player casts. Costs two more generic mana to cast. Whenever Enchanted player casts a spell with the chosen name, you may sacrifice Curse of Silence. If you do, draw a card. It, this is Commander Tax the card. Yeah, let's talk about Tempo, Mike. This <laughs> may not seem like a Commander card, but let's talk about it's how, absolutely this, a commander how card. this impacts Tempo. Because you name their Commander on turn one, and now their Commander costs an extra two mana to play. If their Commander is up on the high end, five, six, seven, eight plus mana Commanders... That can be a real setback. And not to mention that this is every single time that they cast their commander. Mm -hmm. And if you're done leeching value off of them, you can sack it and draw a card. You can cantrip. It's, 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 it's just, it's just genuine. This is a very nice tax effect. I always say I like good effects in white that are a single mana. And this may be one of them. This is not as strong as Nevermore. But it's a lot less likely to get removed than Nevermore. It's also a lot more fair. I, I like the, hey, I'm going to make... I, your commander is going to cost a little bit more because I'm scared of it or whatever. Whatever reason that you're targeting that particular player and that particular commander, all good. I don't like Nevermore because it just says you can't. And sometimes you don't have an ability to remove an enchantment. So here we are. But... This is this is good. Uh, it again, it makes me sad, but in the good way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Continuing talking about tempo, uh, it's important to recognize that a lot of decks that you would be casting this against, decks that are trying to get their commander out on curve, mm-hmm. they've designed their entire strategy, their ramp package, their fixing. It's all based around getting their commander out on curve ASAP. Right. And this could result in it taking more than one additional turn for them to cast their commander. Yeah. Well, heck, my my Silvala Explorer return deck, if this is something that somebody casts on me turn one, I don't know that I'm winning that game. Just because the whole thing that I want to do with that deck is I want to get Silvala out. Exactly. On turn two or three. And now I'm definitely not doing that. Right. Exactly. It's efficient. Uh, let's move on to another way to, well, make things go away or not be as relevant. 
How about Fateful Absence? One generic and a white for an instant. Destroy, destroy target creature or planeswalker. Its controller investigates. They make a colorless clue artifact token with two mana. Sacrifice this artifact. Draw a card. So this is the less efficient, less uh, less nice path to exile sword. It's one more mana. You give them a clue. You destroy instead of... Uh, ex- exile, but you can also target planeswalkers. Which right, is nice. I think it's it's not bad. It's definitely worth comparing this to Swords to Blasters and Path to Exile because uh, Mark Rosewater, in particular, has been very vocal about how he feels that Swords to Blasters and Path to Exile uh, were far too powerful to print. Mm-hmm. Now, I may personally strongly disagree with that, but compare that to this. This is the level we're currently working with for white spot removal. And that's two mana for a more broad but weaker effect that also benefits our opponent. And fortunately mm-hmm. for us, we like doing that. Again, not bad. It, it's it, it's one of those things that if I'm making... I don't know that this is the third card that I'm going to use for a targeted removal after no. Swords and, no. and Path. But it's it's not bad. You know, it, it, it works in a pinch. Planeswalkers can be a problem. I kind of like that and... If I want to give somebody, if I want to destroy somebody and give something valuable to them, I'd probably rather give them a clue than a land more times than not. If I'm just talking about you know raw game gamesmanship, yeah, but get a clue. Anything else? Yeah, exactly. Get a yeah. clue. Uh, you know what else we're gonna get? Yeah. How about I guess Sigard is Vanguard, our last white card here, uh, four generic and a white for a three three creature angel with flash and flying. Whenever Sigard as Vanguard enters the battlefield or attacks, choose any number of creatures with different powers. Those creatures gain double strike until end of turn. Now, this is the moment where we realize that Mike read the card wrong the first time. Oh, did he? Yeah, because I, 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 I read the enters the battlefield. and I'm like, oh, cool, combat trick. I like it. You know, you can do a combat trick on somebody else's turn, give all their creatures double strike. That's awesome. I did not realize that this was also when it attacks as well. And uh, I like this a lot now. Yeah, this is, I think that most people when they see this are thinking this is pumping the board, like a crater hoof style effect. But when we see this, this is a very duelist heritage style combat trick Mm -hmm. where you can flash it in and say, well, this combat, all of your creatures are getting double strike and you're about to blow them out. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is every uh, you know, any given player can have an alpha strike right. as far as I'm concerned and I I love that. That's really good. And I like you it. know what? This is this seems reasonably costed for me too. Like this is this is you know, a flash 3/3 three, three flying that gives things double strike you know, more than once conditionally, but more than once. I'm good with that being a 5 mana cost. Yeah, I think that's I, a fair cost. I like this a lot. Yeah. So um, I, I look forward to somebody killing me with it in the very near future. Um, let's go ahead and move on to blue here. And let's start with the curses, because it's fun to start with the curses, right? Mm-hmm. Curse of Surveillance. Four generic and a blue, or a curse, enchant player. At the beginning of Enchanted Player's Upkeep. Any number of target players other than that player each draw cards equal to the number of curses attached to that player. I guess if we're going to pick on somebody, we're going to pick on somebody hard. Yeah, this is a more highly costed curse like the white one. This is five mana, but it's very clear this is meant to go into a curse deck. Mm -hmm. This is meant to support other curses and... Not only that, but not only can you start to hose the player that you're cursing, but now we get to make political decisions about who else at the table gets to draw cards, which is a very nice effect to have. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, worst case scenario here, it's a, it's a five mana, it's a five mana curse that everybody else gets to draw one card other than the player you curse. I think that the value on this is very low, you need, unless yeah. unless you're running a curse deck, right? And we'll get to that. Yeah, it's it's again, it's 
I I don't I it it seems narrow. You know, you have to be running curses to to run this, and I'd feel like most of the other curses. I, I I could see them in other decks. I'm not sure about this one, but I do. You know, it's 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 cool. It's got creepy art where the hand has a bunch of eyes popping out of it. It is creepy, like yes. Um, so let's move on to a uh, less creepy but more terrifying card and card art with Curse of Unbinding. Uh, six generic and a blue. So seven mana cost spell for an, or a curse enchant player at the beginning of enchanted player's upkeep. That player reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a creature card. Put that card onto the battlefield under your control. That player puts the rest of the revealed cards into their graveyard. That's just pretty insane value. Yeah, I don't know if I would say it's insane value because this is a seven mana curse. But I would say this is an appropriate amount of value for the amount of mana investment. Mm -hmm. Because you're not just denying that player a bunch of cards into their graveyard and taking their creature that's nearest to the top of their library, that creature is also going to you. And you're casting it, well, you're not even casting it, you're just putting it on the field for free. And depending on the player you're putting this on, you're putting this curse effect on, this can be extremely explosive. Exactly. This They're... reminded me of, uh, what is it, Mind's Desire? Yeah. 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 Uh, that's, that's kind of the vibe I was getting from it. The... So most of the time when I see something like this, I I don't know if it's actually true, but I usually associate it with, at my upkeep, I'm going to get to do this thing. Which means it has to survive an entire turn cycle for me to actually get the benefit. Mm-hmm. So the fact that I could do this to the player to my left, pass, immediately get it, yeah, that does feel pretty good. That is very notable. Um, but then you think about it, there's... I, I don't in my, it's not every deck by any means and it's not every playgroup but I'm in a couple of playgroups where hey this deck revolves around getting these two creatures out and okay. those are the only two creatures in their those deck. are the only two creatures so oh boy. I'm gonna take one of them yeah they're done. <laughs> you know they're just so, done yeah and that's the end of the game so this is this is a pretty cool it's a cool effect. Yeah. You know, I don't know how many times it's going to surround the, this uh, actually go around the table um, because the other part of this is if you get too much value off of it, well, now you've become a threat instead of stopping of one, potentially. Um, but either way, pretty cool card. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next one here. Uh, we, we've got better stroke of genius. Um, Drown in Dreams. X, two generic, and a blue for an instant. It says, choose one. If you control a commander as you cast this spell, you may choose both. Target player draws X cards. Target player mills twice X cards. All right. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. Strictly better stroke of genius. Yep. Yeah. That, that's it. That's all there is to say about this. They made better stroke of genius. Drowning dreams. There you go. Uh, next card here is Spectral Adversary. One generic and a blue for 2-1 creature spirit with flash and flying. When Spectral Adversary enters the battlefield, you may pay one and a blue any number of times. When you pay this cost one or more times, put that many plus one plus one counters on Spectral Adversary. Then up to that many other target artifacts, creatures, and or enchantments phase out. Alex, this is nuts. Yeah, this is a flash two mana creature that basically says you pay two mana any number of times and phasing out is a very powerful effect. It doesn't Mm -hmm. remove that permanent forever, but permanents that normally resist being removed through being indestructible, for example are completely powerless to being phased out. This card is everything, go take a nap. Yeah. Like it, it, it's okay. You just need to go somewhere else for a while. If you which I want love. to hit a lot of stuff, you're going to need a big mana investment, but you don't necessarily need to hit a lot of stuff. Right. And this is an instant flash with flying. You can basically hold this up in the same way that you would hold up a counter spell or a psych rift. Right. I mean, even if it's 
The other way to consider this is, is this a four mana? Like This can be a four mana ensure that you're going to win the game if there's something on the board that you have to remove to be able to get through. Right. It is a four mana. This thing is going to become a problem, so I'm going to make it go away. It's it's low side is pretty solid. And its upside is a lot is a lot higher. So I, I, I kind of dig this card because it's good in pretty much every phase of the game. So I like it. Let's move on to our last one here. Visions of Duplicity. Two generic and a blue for a sorcery. Exchange control of two target creatures you don't control. We always love these effects because it's silly. It also has flashback. Eight blue blue. This spell costs X last x less to cast this way where x is the greatest mana value of a commander you own on the battlefield or in the command zone yeah wow so this it's is never gonna cycle, cost eight blue blue <laughs> a, uh, a sorcery flashback cycle that basically is saying hi run this in a commander that has an enormous mana value converted mana cost yeah, yeah. and you're gonna flash it back for possibly depending on your commander cmc less than it costs to cast it yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where usually the flash the flashback costs are going to be you know significantly higher for sure e- even if this is something where you've got a a five mana commander you know i think that's a four or five is pretty it's pretty normal you know, run of the mill yeah right if this is a three mana spell where you exchange two target creatures you don't control and then a four or five mana flashback, that's pretty neat. Yeah, like we've it. we've talked about a lot of cards uh, that have been printed lately with have this uh, swap control of, of things that you don't control, mm-hmm. which, I mean, how do you even begin talking about all the endless possibilities of shenanigans, politics, deals that you can do when you're exchanging control of things and right. you're not even benefiting from it per se right it's not like you're stealing something and giving them something bad back and that's the most common use case no you have to play the game play the social game mm-hmm. if you're running this card and i think that's just phenomenal absolutely it's 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 another kind of i like having those kind of cards and then people knowing that you're going to be able to recur it because now everybody has to think a little bit more about what they're doing. Exactly. Um, so that's what we got for blue. Let's go ahead and move on to black. Curse of Leeches. Two generic and a black for an aura curse. Enchant player. As this permanent transforms into Curse of Leeches, attach it to a player. At the beginning of Enchanted Player's upkeep, they lose one life and you gain one life. It also has Daybound. Turn to the other side. We've got Leeching Lurker, a 4-4 Leech Horror with lifelink, and it's Nightbound. So it transforms back and forth. Talk to me, Alex. Yeah, Mike, this doesn't appear to be phenomenal value, but people like me who have decks that care about players losing any nominal amount of life or you gaining any nominal amount of life, that's life loss, life gain, and life drain decks, which Mm -hmm. black is almost certainly going to be one of the colors in your deck. Uh, being able to proc that effect, to trigger that effect whenever you want to, as well as being able to move it between players pretty readily. That's normally an effect that is very difficult to do, moving an aura to another object. Very few things can actually do that without removing the aura and then bringing it back onto the field. So this is an interesting one. Obviously, again, Losing one life, getting one life, it doesn't seem like much, but there are a lot of effects in the game of Commander that don't care about how much life was lost or gained, just that it happened. Just that it happened. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is this is one of those cards that it might not be the best one to put in my Lieza deck, but I kind of want to put it in there anyway, just because I think it's fun. Like, it's just one more little effect, one more little thing that takes away at life, and Maybe you don't have a ton of those effects, but if you do, like you're talking about, Alex, it's it's definitely an interesting card. Um, moving on to our next curse here. Curse of the Restless Dead. Two generic and a black for an aura curse enchant player. 
Whenever a land enters the battlefield under enchanted player's control, you create a 2-2 black zombie creature token with Decayed. It can't block, when it attacks, sacrifice it at the end of combat. There are several decks that I'm going to put this in. Yeah, this I is a... like this a lot. This is a banger. Uh, immediate comparisons drawn to... Uh, uh, what is it? Valley of the... What what's the land? Land of the dead. Land of the dead. Or, thank you. What, something. Field of the, of the dead. dead. The field of the dead. There you go. Yeah. This immediately draws comparisons to Field of the Dead, except in reverse. Instead yes. of benefiting you when you play lands, it's to the detriment of your opponent and to your benefit when your opponent plays lands, and not just when they play lands. This is very important. There are two different ways for a player to have a land come into their control. They can either play it, which is a turn-based action they can do once each turn on either of their main phases, or they can get a land on the battlefield under their control in any other way, putting it, reanimating it from the graveyard, anything like that. And the latter is a far more broadly encompassing definition that I'm really happy to see here because that makes this card much more powerful than if it said whenever oh, yeah, a player yeah. plays a land. Because no, now I, this I, this counts for ramping, this counts for reanimating lands from the yard, it counts for all sorts of different ways a land can can come under their control. And making a 2-2 each time, they that player's not going to want to stop playing lands, and they're probably not going to. No. I, I'm I'm looking at this more in the yeah, it's a two two that doesn't block and when it attacks you sacrifice it at the end of combat. Right. A lot of decks I mean, you look at that and you're, you're thinking like, oh, what, what good is a bunch of 2-2s two that can only attack? A lot well. of decks are happy to just get a 2-2 two two that they can just sacrifice for value. Yes. And that's where I was leaning. Yeah. So I like that you have to sacrifice it at the end of combat, which is good. Because if, if, if the only way that you have as far as sack outlet, if it's, oh, whenever a creature dies, you get this. Well, good. It means it's happening. It has its own sack outlet. Yeah, and yeah. that's and that's the point. Like, if you don't have a sack out, like, great, this is still good. Like, exactly. is this going in my Marin deck? Absolutely. Oh, for is, sure. <laughs> is this going in any Aristocrats deck? It should. Yeah, this is an excellent curse. It's a really good card. Yeah, agreed. Uh, let's move on to our next one. Um, the aptly named Eaten Alive. <laughs> it's a black for a sorcery, uh, so a one mana cost spell. But as an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature or play three generic and a black. Exile target creature or planeswalker. Another one of those, how efficient of removal do you want to go? Um, this is a black sorcery that exiles a creature or planeswalker. Yeah, this is for, extremely efficient. Yeah, for one and sacrifice a creature is great. Yeah. You're not paying... Uh, huh. Three and a black. You're sacrificing a creature. Yeah, this is this, this is, is a this common, is not a five mana cost. This is yeah. a common mic. Yeah, this card's gonna I, cost zero cents. Yep. At least it's a sorcery. That's all I'll say. Right. Because if, if this if were this an, instant, an instant, oh it's, my god, it's, it's mythic as oh far as I'm concerned. God. Um. But yeah, it's just hey, let's let's do hyper efficient. Do the thing that black genuinely, eh, not genuinely generally wants to do and we're going to give you some upside to it sacrifice creatures cool also pay one mana and you're going to exile something gross um this one it makes me very happy except for the fact that it definitely would have gone into the piru deck um let's talk about slaughter specialist one generic and a black for a three three vampire warrior when Slaughter Specialist enters the battlefield, each opponent creates a 1-1 white human creature token. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, put a plus one, plus one counter on a Slaughter Specialist. Great. Yeah. Give people value. Yep. Here you go. Have some 1-1s. One I, I, I'm going to go ahead and just connect the dots here that this this uh, this vampire warrior is going to uh, be feeding off these these little one ones that you're creating for everybody else because it gets bigger. Cool. I, I I like it. I would be overjoyed just to play this sack and reanimate it over and over for right donating value. This is one of those recurrable would be would be funds. I I almost you know if this it dies is a, a new hunted creature. 
Yeah. Hun- hunted Wumpus, hunted uh, all that other stuff. But it's two mana. It's two mana. It gets bigger. All that good stuff. This is this is not the hunted. This is the hunter. Right. Exactly. <laughs> type, which I kind of dig. The other important thing is that uh, the death trigger is whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, not non-token. Yep. And a lot of these effects specify non-token because it's really easy to get rid of a lot of tokens. Yep. So you can make this girl extremely big. Yep. I'm a big fan. It, it is It is a cool effect. I dig it. Uh, let's move on to one of the weirder cards as far as the amount of stuff that it does, but I'm very, I like it's, it's, it's genuinely just good. Uh, the meat hook massacre X black, black for a legendary enchantment. When meat, the meat hook massacre enters the battlefield, each creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn gross already. When a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life. Whenever a creature an opponent control dies, you gain one life. So this is a board wipe that then sticks around and becomes an aristocrat's piece. Yeah, this is really something else entirely. It is. This is quite this a is... bit like uh, Massacre Girl, a little bit. Yeah. Massacre Girl has that like cascading board wipe effect for her value. Mm-hmm. But this one has the upside of... Okay, even if you play this for two mana, black, black, you're still getting this excellent aristocrat style effect, or I, I guess what, a blood artist effect, yeah. where every time a creature you control dies, each opponent loses a life, and whenever a creature an opponent control dies, you gain one life. And you're getting that for two mana, which I would take that for two mana, but in addition yeah. to that, you can also pay any amount of mana and get a massive minus X, minus X board wipe. And it's, it's when it enters the battlefield, not when you cast it. So you can right. reanimate See, this. Yep. It's well, gross. if you re excuse me, if you reanimate it, then X is zero. But if you right. reanimate it back to your hand and then cast it again, you can do that. Well, and here's the other thing. This is a this is a when you cast it as a board wipe, or you know, to sweep some of the board at the very least you get the benefit off of it right off the bat and you then do. it sticks yeah. around to keep you the rest of the benefit exactly so yeah this is this is really cool i also am a big fan of any i'm a big fan of any board wipe where i can play around with it and it can be a okay well i'm playing against tokens so x is one exactly kind of thing and then and then you're gonna the gain that much of, life oh, that's that's pretty that's pretty nice yeah um, let's go ahead and move on to the Vengeful Strangler here. Uh, um, the Scranton Strangler. Uh, one generic and a black for a 2-1 human rogue. Uh, Vengeful Strangler can't block. When Vengeful Strangler dies, return it to the battlefield transformed under your control. Uh, under your control, attached to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. And it transforms into Strangling Grasp. Enchantment aura, enchant creature, or planeswalker and opponent controls at the beginning of your upkeep. Enchanted permanence controller sacrifices a non-land permanent and loses one life. Yeah. That's nutty. Certain decks, decks that don't commit a lot to the board, Uh control decks in general that are just having a few key pieces on the board that they need to keep their strategy running. Devastating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is a two, For two mana, mana. Two mana. Kill it, and then it turns into hey, on, on your upkeep, you have to sacrifice something. And we also can't ignore that loses one life effect, which a lot yep. of life drain decks care about. Just care about the effect, exactly, not, about not how the much. amount. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, let's uh, finish up black here with visions of dread. Two generic and a black for a sorcery. Target opponent puts a creature card of their choice from their graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. And then has flashback 8 black black, where this spell costs X less to cast this way, where X is the greatest mana value of a commander you own on the battlefield or in the command zone. I, it, it's th- This is really, really, really low-costed. This is just oozing fun, because it's, you can ugh. steal their best creature. You can cut a deal and... and like, hey, listen, I need that card out of your graveyard to do this. Let's make it happen. 
Um, I think that if you play this without cutting a deal and you don't arrange their graveyard correctly, you're just asking for trouble. This is a political card and you need to play it as such. All of that is true. At the same time, this is a this is a three mana. If you have just removed, if they're not running a bunch of creatures and you just remove something terrifying, great. It's a three mana. I would like that, please. And yeah, this is ooh, that that's good. And then the flashback again, the exact same thing we were talking about before. Yeah, with the uh, it's other the vision cycle. This, this is really good. All right, Alex. Um, we've got a couple more cards here. But I want to get into, you know, I want to get into red and green and then talk about the multicolored cards and commanders that we're excited about this set. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to take a little bit of a break here. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. And, you know, it's one of those weird sets where we've got a lot of white cards we want to talk about. We've got a lot of black cards we want to talk about, even a few blue not as much talking about with uh, red and green here, but let's get into it. Curse of Obsession. Four generic and a red for an aura curse enchant player. At the beginning of enchanted player's draw step, that player draws two additional cards. At the beginning of enchanted player's end step, that player discards their hand. Uh, yikes. Yeah. This is, uh, <laughs> this is an interesting one. And, yeah. Uh, the, the visual reference, I believe, would be to the Telltale Heart by Edgar mm-hmm. Allan Poe. He's ripping yep. up the floorboards. Um, yeah, you're giving the other player gas, but they have to use it all right away because their hand's going away. This is a yeah. very devastating curse to give to somebody. Oh, for sure. It's, I mean, again, it is it is a five mana ability that is really going to give you the benefit at the end of somebody else's turn which is a little bit of a gamble but if you if you want to put somebody in a vice here it is you you better go fast this is going to force your opponent to play as suboptimally as possible yep (laughs) if they were going to win on their turn they're still going to have that potential Outside of that, they're going to lose a lot of the value that they were. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is if they have done something like draw 20 cards, draw their whole library, and they have no maximum hand size, no maximum hand size doesn't matter when you're discarding your entire hand. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Uh, Let's move on to a couple more curses here. Curse of Shaken Faith, one generic and a red for enchantment or a curse enchant player whenever enchanted player casts a spell other than the first spell they cast each turn or copies a spell curse of shaken faith deals two damage to them neat yep it stacks up yep nice little tempo piece as far as no you're i'm gonna hurt you a little bit more each time that you try and cast off if you try and storm all of that i i kind of dig that two mana spell okay i dig it what do you think, Alex? I think it goes in curse decks. Yeah, and, uh, that's fair. and that's about it. That's fair. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what we've got for red and green. Again, even even a shorter list here, but I think it's really neat. Curse of Clinging Webs. Two generic and a green for an enchantment or a curse. Enchant player. Whenever a non-token creature enchanted player control dies, exile it, and you create a one-two green spider creature token with reach. This so, one's really nice. It's really nice. And I'm sitting here doing the, okay, I get to create a token whenever a non-token creature dies on somebody else's battlefield. For three mana, that's, you know, okay. But exile. Exile. That, yep. okay, good. Sorry, graveyard decks. Yep. Not not happening. Not today. Play this and wipe the board and your board will fill up and their board will go to exile. Yep. It's it, it. I'm I'm always looking for the reason to make a spider deck. It's difficult, but I'm there. This is another. You got to find an excuse another, to run Arachnogenesis because it's not as good as it looks. I know, I know, but it it's this isn't bad. That's all I'm saying. This isn't bad. No, I like um, this one. I, I like the you know the nope uh, graveyards are going to be turned off, and you have an incentive to kill things anyway. Not just because you want them to go away, but Hey, if this, it feels bad to have to target this thing if you're a recursion deck, you know? 
Oh, for but sure. You have to. Yeah. You have to. Absolutely. Like, you can't stick around. Uh, so that's what we've got for red and green. Let's move on to the multicolor cards here. And, you know, we just talked red and green. So how about we talk about a red and green card? Dire Strain Rampage. One generic, a red and a green for a sorcery that says destroy target artifact, enchantment, or land. If a land was destroyed this way, its controller may search their library for up to two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. Otherwise, its controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. It also has flashback for three generic red-green. Okay. This is destroy whatever is the most problematic non-creature, non-planeswalker on the board, and give somebody some value off of it. If you destroy a land, great, they get two. You can target your own stuff if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. It's... It's it's kind of a, uh, I, I I like the card a lot. It, it, it's it, it it's got a good amount of. It's got a lot of options, and I like doing that on a card. Three mana isn't too much. Uh, it is a sorcery, so right. You know you don't have that instant speed removal. But I'm okay with being able to target several different things, including land, and get value off of it, and also giving a little bit of a, hey, I'm really sorry I had to destroy that combo piece, but I'm going to give you a land off of it. Yeah, if you're removing a land with this and giving them two basics, the land that you removed is way more powerful than having two basics. Yeah. You destroyed sure. a Gaia's Cradle, you destroyed a Cabal Coffers, something like, that's really powerful, and ramping them is nice for us. We like this effect of, of ramping mm -hmm. our friends, but... We also like this idea of, of a consolation prize after you say, no, no, no. You can't have that. You can have this this little thing. That's okay. But you can't have that. Right. And then you can do it twice. Yeah. I, I I love the idea of, you know, the worst case scenario on this card is, okay, I'm going to ramp. Yeah. You can <laughs> ramp gonna... yourself, destroy one of your lands, yeah. ramp two. Yep. Exactly. It's like Harrow. Uh, yeah. It, yep. it's, it's like Harrow. I, and again, the idea that, hey, this is something where... I can target lands or artifacts or enchantments. So it's not it's not as powerful as, you know, destroy target permanent, mm -hmm. but I lean towards liking this card a lot. Like that, even if it didn't have the, you know, destroy target artifact or enchantment part, there's still some decks that I'd run this in because if somebody has a glacial chasm and I'm playing a combat deck, I I I don't have anything I can do. Oh yeah, you got to deal with my glacial chasm. So, I do like it. Um, other card we want to talk here before we get into some of the uh, the commanders, the lead singers. Uh, let's see about Wake to Slaughter. Three generic, black, red for a sorcery. Choose up to two target creature cards in your graveyard. An opponent chooses one of them. Return that card to your hand. Return the other to the battlefield under your control. It gains haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next end step. It also has flashback for four generic, black, red. So one more than you cast it the first time. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> this is very much like uh, Karn, Karn Steel that he has, yeah, where yeah. you'll reveal the top two cards of your library. One of them goes into exile and one of them goes to your hand. Um, yeah, your, your opponent's making a decision, but mm -hmm. the worst they can screw you over is not very much. Yeah, you're... The worst case is they're going to pick the card that you want to be able to use for more than a turn. Right. To go onto the battlefield, give it haste, and then exile. Oh, no. One of the creatures that I had on my, in my graveyard is going to enter the battlefield and be able to do something immediately. Yeah. I can deal with that. And it is flashback. Flashback is just tacking on this extra value to this effect mm -hmm. that is already on rate, right? It's already on rate to reanimate something in black for five mana. Yeah. And it's 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 not even like the flashback cost is a lot more. It, it's one mana. It's one more. more. Yeah. To be able to do some pretty pretty good stuff, you know, especially. So here's my it's 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 even choose up to two target creature cards. So at a certain point, you can even if you just really have to get one card back. On well, if you get one, it it won't hand. go to the battlefield. It'll go to your hand if you choose one. Right. Uh, sorry, I, I apologize. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's. It, again, another one of those, the downside of this card is it's a little bit higher cost than I would normally like to play. That's fine. 
because the upside is significantly higher and you have mm-hmm. flashback and 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 nice job good job wizards um let's go ahead and move on to our our last cards here are commanders and they all happen to be multicolored starting with denik pious apprentice white blue for a legendary creature human soldier two three life link cards and graveyards can't be the targets of spells or abilities and it has a keyword or it has an ability disturb for two generic white blue you may cast this card from your graveyard transformed for its disturb cost other side denik pious apparition legendary creature spirit soldier three two with flying whenever one or more creature cards are put into graveyards from anywhere investigate this ability triggers only once each turn so you create a clue token whenever a creature card is put into a graveyard from anywhere once each turn if Denik, Pious Apparition, would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. There's a lot going on with this card, Alex. Help me out. I agree. There's a, I think there's a very clear gameplay loop that this card is meant to be played as. You're mm-hmm. meant to cast it from your command zone very early for two mana, white and a blue. And it has this anti-graveyard effect, this grave hate effect. Tar- cards yep. and graveyards can't be the targets of spells or abilities. That basically rules out any kind of reanimation except for mass reanimation like Rise of the Dark Realms. Right. Which, Something that isn't targeting. Yeah. And that's a really expensive effect. You don't usually see that effect very early. Um, this isn't going to outright hose graveyard decks, but it's interesting because you can either have it die or sacrifice it and then have it go to your graveyard instead of the command zone and then disturb him. And mm-hmm. then he comes back with a completely different ability that uh, wants things to go to the graveyard. And you're going to investigate each time that happens. Now, it's only once per turn, but to be fair, this is a two-mana creature. Yeah. And you're going to get those nice clue tokens. And then if the uh, the Pious Apparition dies, the back face, mm-hmm. then you'll exile it, put it back in the command zone, and cast it again. And this time for yeah. uh, four mana. two, two and white and blue four mana. Yeah. So, which is the same as the disturb exactly cost of casting exactly. Graveyard. So I mean, every this is other a, time yeah. when you're disturbing him, you're paying this static cost. So it's mm-hmm. almost like you're getting your commander twice. And this is relevant even on the back face. He's still your commander. He does commander yeah. damage and all that relevant stuff for commanders. It's not a it's powerful a commander, card. but this no, is this is a very it, new and interesting control commander. Yeah, put it this way. Like, I don't know that I would be freaking out playing against this commander. You know, it's not one where it, it, I'm necessarily going to be, a, oh, no, I have to be aware. But it does a, it does an interesting effect. It, 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 is, it seems like one of those decks that I would like to pilot because I want to I want to be able to, OK, I'm going to. Cast my commander. We're going to remove uh, graveyards from being able to be target of abilities. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, it, all right, let's get it killed, put it over. It It seems like it's a lot of the, if you could synergize it with the rest of your 99, it could be a fun commander to play. I don't know, again, yeah. like you said, how this, powerful it is. It's but, not very powerful. I think this is a very interesting build path yeah. because you're going to have these parts of your deck that are of a roughly similar theme, but they each are going to want. Okay, sorry, my boss just jammed me. Um, no, each of them are going to want a a different face of the commander, and I think the interesting thing is that if you were to use a legendary copy effect such as Helm of the Host on Denik, and okay. then, um. You could, for example, sacrifice or destroy one of those copies, the new one you just made, perhaps, uh, or rather the original because the new one's a token. And the original goes to the graveyard and then you'll disturb it. Now, now you have both faces of the commander on the battlefield. Yeah. And that, I think, is a very interesting effect because now you can put things into the graveyard, you investigate, and then people can't get them back out. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that... This deck, in my opinion, would work well running all of these legendary style coffee effects. There are a few of them in blue, 
and then colorless that really just want to have both versions of Denik out at the same time. I think that'd be really cool. That would be interesting. I like that idea. Let's move on to Rem Carlos, Stalwart Slayer. What, again, awesome title. Good job by you, Rem. Uh, one generic red-white for a 2-3 legendary creature human knight with flying and haste. If a spell would deal damage to you or another permanent you control, prevent that damage. If a spell would deal damage to an opponent or a permanent an opponent controls, it deals that much damage plus one instead. I'm less worried about the second half of that there. But this is, I mean, this is protection from damage spells. Yeah, this is, this is very cool. reminiscent of Gisela, Blade of Gold Knight, except Gisela yeah. costs a ton of mana, and this doesn't. Yeah, I it's... It does again. It's it's uh, if a spell, right? Yes, if a spell. So, so we're we're not getting the the insane ability that you get from Gisela, but right. we're getting a much more efficiently costed two three flying haste. That if you're playing red, yeah. If you're doing you know the chain reaction type of board wipes, I the blasphemous. Yeah, act that's what I was gonna wipes. say. This you is, want to talk about yeah. blasphemous act? This, this is, is that's this is the doing signature work. spell. In this yeah. deck is Splash Missad, because that's a one mana asymmetric board wipe in this deck. Holy yeah. moly, Mike. Wow. Well, the other the other deck that I was thinking this would be fun to play in is put it in the 99 of a Jared Carthelian deck. Yeah. Carthelian? Carthelian? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Um, because, hey, let's say you get Jared real big and strong. Cool. Now I'm going to be playing, you know, my do lots of damage to lots of uh, creatures spells. Or you still want to be able to keep a board state just in case you can't keep Jared out there. I, a flying 2-3 hasted creature that does a little bit more damage uh, whenever you, you know, it's not even, man, it's not even a spell you control. Yeah, that's that's the other thing is that if Ooh. another player happens to be running a damaging spell... Uh, it's they're going to leech extra value out of that. And that's quite nice as well. I think that this, we're highlighting this in, in particular, A, because opponents can take advantage of it, but B, because this is a Boros card that doesn't directly care about combat. And there yeah. are very few Boros commanders that don't care about combat, Mike. I thought we were putting it on here because the art. What what is Rem Carlos riding? Yeah, on that's a good right question now? because it has the body of a horse and the mm-hmm. head and neck of a swan, and With the, the wings, wings and of yeah. something. Yeah. So I'm not very well versed on uh, mythological car? creatures. So maybe one of our listeners who knows, like, is this a hippogriff? Like, what is this thing? Is this a sensoir? A sensoir. <laughs> Mike, let's move on to by far yeah. the most interesting commander yeah. in the entire set. We did that thing where we saved it for last. Lind, cheerful tormentor. I get very much like, like the you know wicked witch of the woods vibes. Yeah, and, I mean, and she's like, wearing a leather vest and corset and. Yep. Is just very merrily poking her voodoo doll of the unlucky planeswalker from the previous yep. curse cycle in 2016, I think. Yep. Yeah. I uh, so one generic blue, black, red for a legendary creature, human warlock, two four with death touch. Whenever a curse is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, return it to the battlefield attached to you at the beginning of the next end step. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may attach a curse attached to you. To one of your opponents, if you do draw two cards, this I really like is this really cool. Yeah, the this only, is really cool. The only downside to this for me is that currently, right now, there aren't enough Grixis curses for you to make interesting decisions about your Lind curse deck that would mm-hmm. make it different from another Lind curse deck. Every Lind curse deck that currently exists is going to share almost all of its DNA with every other Lin Curse deck. However, maybe next set, we might get some more curses. And then maybe next year, we might get a couple more. Over time, this Curse Commander, the first one ever, 
mm-hmm. will become more and more interesting. Can I? Okay. This card is an A for me. Not because of its viability, but because of just how fun it seems. Like, I, yeah. I love, I love, okay, I'm going to curse people. Oh, no, you remove my curse. Well, it's going to go to my graveyard. It's going to come back. Morphin, oh, no, I'm cursed. Right. <laughs> there is that. Um, I, I, I love that. The only thing that would have taken this card and made me more happy is if that generic was actually a white. Yeah, it's it's been quite a while since they've done uh, four mana. I know, uh, and I but, and yeah. I understand, but if I could have had all of the white curses, and then I also could have put in, like, if I, if I could have put Zedru in this. In yeah, that's this, really the thing, I, right? Is there are so yeah. many very powerful curses in white that which I might would want that to might be, be part of it, right? Yeah, yeah, because if 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 this was four color white, if this was Brea the curse person. Um, that that might have been pretty nutty, but I like I the know. card a lot. Yeah, I, it's I a like really a cool effect. Yeah, overwhelming splendor. I would have loved to include in here. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I Curse mean, even silence. the ones that we talked about earlier, like yeah, the Curse of Silence ones. being able to go in there would exactly be nuts. Yeah, but, like I said, this is um, it's the first time we've ever gotten a Curse Commander. Before this, people were using Mathis Fiend Seeker, which is not a Curse Commander. It, he's just a, a commander that can. Uh, as a as an effect, support curses theoretically because he's like thematically yeah. aligned with curses, but not yeah. really. This is a curse commander that wants you to play curses, but in addition to that, it doesn't just support curses being reanimated. It doesn't just mm-hmm. give you card draw, which is what you would want on a commander. It also has this very interesting effect where temporarily you're the one who's cursed, right? And you're going to have to deal with that until it comes back around to your turn. And, you know, at the same time, great. I'm going to draw two cards after it comes to my upkeep because I'm going to put... You would want to be running... Uh, you want to be running all of the copy trigger effects, multiple yep. upkeep effects. Yep. You want to get rid of every... Because let's say a player loses and they had four curses on them. You don't want to take four turns to donate all those curses <laughs> away. You want to get rid of them right now. Yeah, it's not a May ability. It's happening. So this is this is a Paradox Haze kind of dead yeah it, it, you need to have that in there yeah um but yeah linda's linda's cool and i again i can't get past the cheerful tormentor just little well, that's smart. grixis for you isn't it yeah yeah i get it she's this, got a magic is, mirror over there in the left this is the it was agatha all along curse uh commander which i'm yeah. i'm all for um so alex what do you think overall about the set i i'm i'm pretty I'm pretty pumped. You know, yeah, like our, I, I, there's a lot of cards in here. here. We we have so many new political cards, and it's really more than we could ever ask for. Like I said, only a few years ago, we were lucky if we got a handful of political cards of mm-hmm. symmetric effects, of group hug effects, maybe one every few sets. But now it's a different story because as Wizard starts to change their design philosophy to adapt to commander more they aren't just creating all these super powerful symmetric effects that give you a lot of board value or these ultra powerful commanders that dominate the board for not a lot of mana those are ways of designing for commander but another and i would say even more important way of designing for commander is designing around the multiplayer political aspect and mm-hmm. it wasn't that long ago that you had to wait for a set like Conspiracy or Battle Bond to get a bunch of cards like this. But now it's just in any old standard set. And Mike, I'm very happy to see it. Me too. I, I, I think it's a good direction. Um, you know, it's there are some cards that are coming in this set that we didn't talk about that, you know, are they new staples for the format and et cetera and those conversations. Yeah, but that's not for us to do. No. And more importantly. Go listen to CMDR Central. More importantly, when you're listening to those and you're looking at those cards, know that there's still a lot of stuff that's coming out like this. You know, the stuff that we're excited about as far as, hey, this is just, you know, stuff that's more interaction on the board, more interaction with the players. Um, not so group hucky, the set. But, no, uh, not a lot of group hug this set. A lot of, a lot of politics, but not so much group hug. And I think that was expected. And hopefully yeah. we'll be back here not too long from now talking about Crimson Vow, the vampire wedding set. Yeah. And hopefully that's going to have uh, another oh, big pile of political effects. It's a political wedding and like all this other, yeah, like it's, yeah. it's gotta, it's, it's gotta. Got to. All yeah. right. Well, 
in the meantime, if anybody has any questions about, you know, uh, day and night, et cetera, uh, how would they be able to reach out to you? Sure. You can find me on Twitter at Lappermedic, L-A-P-P-E-R-M-E-D-I-C, or you can email me at alex at edhrec.com. If you've enjoyed our conversation, please subscribe and rate the podcast. If you want to buy any of the cards we talked about, deck boxes, sleeves, etc., you can support us by going to bit.ly slash edh underscore social. We have a Discord link in our show notes as well. You can go there to submit cards for us to talk about. You can ask Honorable Judge Alex questions about interactions and how the rules work for Magic. More times than not, people ask questions in there that I didn't realize were questions, and then I get the explanation from Alex, and then I'm more confused, but at least I know what the actual scenario is. So, Magic is a complicated game. It's all right to ask questions. Follow us on Twitter at EDH underscore social, or email us at the social contract EDH at gmail.com. Have fun with the set. Have fun making deals. Curse your opponents, and if you're playing Lind, curse yourself. But the point is, we'll talk to you soon.